The nice people at the Tank Museum in Bovington have asked me to pick my five favorite tanks. Would I like to do this? They said, I said, yes! I, I, you know, I considered the matter for a while and then I said yes. Um, because uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to come here and view the world's most comprehensive collection of tanks. They've got everything here from the very latest tanks right the way back to the very first tanks. And this place also has a warm childhood association for me because I came here twice as a child, once with a school trip. And, and before that, when I was eight or nine, my father brought my brother and I here. And um, we had a wonderful time, um, you know, counting all the rivets and, and getting down on the floor and looking under the tanks and, and uh, and we both love tanks because we both made Airfix and Matchbox kits. Um, like, like this one, for instance, which is the very one that I bought in the gift shop on the way out. It's, a, it's an M16 half-track with uh, uh, quad machine gun anti-aircraft guns on it. But it doesn't really matter what it is. The fact is that that is the vehicle that uh, I bought here. Um, so I have warm associations with the place and I get to see loads of tanks, which is you know, obviously just innately good. So let's get on with it and start with my fifth choice. Right, now I've selected this, the Swedish S-Tank, the Stridsvagen 103. And why? Well, because it's bats. This is a fabulous example of thinking out of the envelope. Um, and although this never saw action, the country, Sweden, which had to take its defense very seriously, there was a Russian threat not very far away, they were relying for decades on these. This was the Swedish main battle tank, and it is so unlike other tanks that had gone before it. You'll see that it has no turret. In fact, well, does it have no turret or does it have no hull? Is this a turret on wheels or is, is this a, a, a hull with the main gun built into it? You can look at it either way. So, you can't move this gun relative to the, I'm going to call it the hull, of the tank at all. So how do you aim the gun? Well, you had to aim the entire vehicle. So they had to develop a way of moving the suspension either side so that the whole tank could sit up or sit down for the up and down, and the driver had to be able to move in tiny, tiny increments left and right so that this gun could be fired accurately at a tank-sized target many thousands of yards away. And they managed it. They got this to work. There's a big drawback, of course, of this uh, concept, and that is there's no way you can fire on the move and have any hope of hitting anything. But this wasn't designed for that. This was a defensive tank. This was for skulking in cover, firing, and then getting out very quickly. And getting out quickly was easy in this thing because it had a driving position, not just at the front, Front, but at the back. So the driver could be ready to go as soon as you fire the gun, woof, you could be driving backwards and he could actually see where he was going as well in both directions. Now, one reason that tanks don't perhaps work always brilliantly well in video games is that a tank is a collaborative thing. You've got to have a commander and a gunner and a loader and a driver and so forth, all doing different jobs, all acting as a team. Um, but if you wanted a tank to, to use in a video game, perhaps this would be the one, because in theory, one man could crew this. The, there were duplicate controls. The commander had duplicate gun controls. The driver had duplicate gun, gun controls. So you could be a driver able to move the gun, uh, get the, the, the whole vehicle into position, aim the gun using the drive controls, and then fire the gun, and then it would automatically reload using the auto loader. So one man could, at least in theory, crew this vehicle, which is just bats. It's extremely uh, sharply uh, angled at the front. It's like a big wedge. It always reminds me of uh, a lot of the robots in Robo Wars and so forth. They have this wedge design. The arm is quite thin. It's only 40 millimeters. But because of this, this uh, angle and the whole thing being so low and such a small target, it was actually quite a survivable tank. Um, as I say, it did never see action. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, clearly, uh, the Russians were so fearful of the Swedish S tank that they never invaded Sweden. So a successful design, you could say, because it was never used. Right, I don't think it's going to surprise anyone that I've picked this uh, because this is big, German, heavy and powerful. And if I didn't pick one vehicle that was a big, heavy, German, powerful thing, then perhaps I'd be lynched. Uh, this is the Jagd Panther. Uh, you've probably heard of the Panther tank. Well, this was the, the tank destroyer version. So instead of a turret, uh, it's got this low set fearsomely powerful 88mm anti-tank gun on the front of it, and it was a very effective and feared weapon. So this could do its job, it could knock out enemy tanks and then scoot. This is mainly 
a defensive weapon. So using this, this is ambush pattern camouflage. They, they would uh, lurk in a wood or some, behind some other bit of cover and fire off a few shots, all going well, uh, knock out a few enemy tanks or at least uh, see the uh, enemy tanks all dash for cover and then get out of there. These were mostly knocked out by things like typhoons, by, by anti-tank firing uh, ground attack craft. Um, You've got to remember, these are late war vehicles, uh, so at the, at, in, in the late war, the Germans are on the defensive and uh, they don't have air superiority, so they have to hide these as much as they can uh, and travel at night. Uh, it was difficult getting one of these into the right position, but once in position, it did have this extremely effective gun. Uh, people may talk about how brilliantly armored these tanks were, but uh, you know, it's only got just over three inches of armor at the front, but it is, as you can see, very sloping. And the Jagd Panther had these wheels. And uh, you may think they're very good looking, they're very impressive, they're big, and they're, they're overlapping in this complicated way. And yes, it did uh, distribute the weight quite nicely on the tracks, but there were big drawbacks. It's extremely difficult to repair anything because almost everything you want to get to is jammed behind something. So you're going to have to take this wheel off. And then to get to that wheel, you've got to take that wheel and that wheel off. But to get that wheel off, you've got to take that wheel off. So there was, you spent so much of your time screwing and unscrewing these bolts, which of course would then lose their thread. And these wheels jammed a lot because tanks tend to go through mud and so forth. And mud would get jammed into these really quite small uh, gaps between the wheels. And if you're on the Russian front, of course, it's mixed with stones and then snow and then ice. And then you stop for the night and then everything freezes. And in the morning, you've got to unjam all of these wheels, which could take hours. Um, so possibly this wasn't actually the best design. Right, now to have a look at the engine deck of the Jagd Panther. Uh, you can see the big hatch in the back there, which crewmen could get in and out of, uh, and the smaller hatch there, which could be used for, amongst other things, uh, ejecting spent uh, cartridges and so forth. They're hot pieces of metal. You'd much rather get rid of them. So after firing the gun, shove it out the back and uh, uh, never mind where it goes after that. Um, engine decks are always a vulnerable part of a tank like this. So you've got a, a fairly well armored, this isn't brilliantly armored thing. You can actually see in the, in the, the back of the casemate there, you can see the thickness uh, in the weld there of the side armor. It's only what, it's less than, certainly less than two inches. A Sherman armor piercing uh, shell would go sailing through that quite happily. It wasn't brilliantly armored, but it was well armored. And this is the vulnerable deck. This bit part of the tank it has loads of holes in it that you can see, and an infantryman putting a, a jerry can with a few grenades attached to it might set off a, a fire that would drip burning petrol down into your engine, and, and that could spell the end for you. Uh, and of course, this is what an aircraft would aim its uh, two centimeter cannons at, and an awful lot of these came to grief by that method. But it's still, it's still a fearsome beast. I can remember seeing one of these in a French tank museum, and uh, we parked our family car. It was a Rover. We thought it was a really big car, but next to this, uh, it looked uh, comically tiny. The mighty Jagd Panther. Uh, so why have I picked this particular tank destroyer? Well, again, it's largely out of loyalty to my childhood self. You see, uh, I, I had three models of uh, this when Matchbox brought out the kit, and I liked the shape. One of the reasons I like the shape uh, is that it's a bit sci-fi, a bit sort of sleek and menacing, but also it's very easy to draw. Uh, and I like drawing tanks. And uh, I could just, uh, just without having the model in front of me, I could draw this from almost any angle. Um, and it, uh, it, it pleased me so much that I got three of them. I remember I made them as I was gluing the kits together. I had all the bits sort of laid out. So I have the three guns together, like, like uh, in the, on a production line in a factory. And um, so out of loyalty to my childhood self, I have picked the Jagd Panther. Do you know what the word for tank in Russian is? It's tank. The Russians called tanks tanks because the British called tanks tanks and the British invented the tank and these were the first tanks. They were called tanks because the people who made them thought they looked a bit like water tanks. It's a large box with boilerplate riveted on the outside of it and it was useful for security. So they carried on calling them tanks because they didn't want the Hun, who is always listening, to know that the British were moving around this new weapon of war. So if you called it something harmless, like tank, uh, they perhaps wouldn't be so suspicious. 
Now, I said these were the first tanks. This is actually a Mark IV, not a Mark I. So why didn't I pick the Mark I? Because, you know, that's the granddaddy of all tanks. Well, I picked the Mark IV because this is the first tank that was really used effectively in battle as a weapon of war. It's the first tank that was made in significant numbers. They made about 1,200 of these. And 100 years ago at the Battle of Cambrai, they used these en masse for the first time on the right sort of ground. They didn't get bogged down, well, not too many of them got bogged down because they picked the right bit of turf to, to, to crawl across in these monsters that, of course, terrified the Germans. The Germans didn't have tanks. And this shape is designed with one purpose. It's for crossing trenches because this is for breaking the deadlock on the Western Front. So both sides are fighting quite a static war. They're in these deep trenches. By the time these came out, both sides had got very, very good at building trenches and bunkers. So what could break this, this agonizing deadlock that was mowing down so many of the, 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 the flower of youth in, in Europe? Well, this was the idea. You have this huge front angled section that rears up and the length of the tank is enough so that it can cross the, uh, 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 the whole of a trench in one go. But they had no suspension. These were early days. This is just a, a frame with plate uh, weld, um, riveted onto it. So it would cross the trench and at some awful moment there would be a great crash as the front of the tank would hit the other side of the, of the trench and this was quite inconvenient for the people inside. There's a famous piece of film uh, where a tank back in Britain at a testing station is being demonstrated in front of the king. And the tank goes up a crazy angle of slope and then comes crashing down in an impressive way and then is able to carry on. And then the doors open and out come just a few crewmen and stand there bolted upright to attention to be inspected by his majesty. Uh, why didn't all eight men come out? because the rest of them had all been knocked unconscious. Uh, being on the inside of one of these when it came crashing down with no suspension uh, was um, somewhat uncomfortable. Um, now, we're going to take a look inside and you may be amazed at, at the conditions in there. I'm inside in a gunner's position. There will be two men operating this six-pounder in the side sponson. So there'd be a man here, a man where I am, and the man here would also have access to this, which was a Lewis gun port, so there'd be a machine gun going rat tat tat there. And all around the tank, there are loads of these little oval holes. Those are pistol ports because, you know, the Hun sometimes got dangerously close and you needed to shoot at some extreme angle so you could get the muzzle of your Webley revolver through there and uh, give him what for. There are quite a few of those in the ceiling as well because uh, sometimes they would climb on top. These things are only moving at walking pace, don't forget. Now, there are eight men in here, so we've got two on this gun, and then just here, there's a gear operator, and he's operating the gears here, according to the instructions, low, high, in, out, in, uh, and there's another one the other side. But how does he get his instructions? Well, clearly someone has to attract his attention, so they could just whack him on the shoulder. Oh, what? What does the commander want? Well, the commander would be sitting up here, looking forwards, through this hatch and perhaps he, he sees some need to change gear, something's coming up, uh-oh. So he needs to attract the attention so he could physically kick someone to get their attention or he could get a spanner and whack it onto something hard to make lots of noise. Um, and then there was a system of hand signals for this gear, that gear and so forth. If he needed to signal to another tank, he could poke flags up through the holes. There's a pistol port here, for instance, for shooting back along the top of the tank. But you could stick a flag through there and wave it to signal to another tank. But what if he needed to send a message back to HQ? Well, that's when the pigeons come in. You see, there would be a basket somewhere and in that basket would be some pigeons. Whether they'd be in the peak of condition, what with all the heat and the fumes and everything, is um, well, that's unlikely, one would imagine, but you would attach the message to the pigeon's leg and let it go, perhaps out of the, the door out of the back. And as long as a German sniper then didn't see it and shoot it, it, there was a chance. There was a chance that it would get back to HQ and, and give them the good news. Um, so it was all very high tech. How hot did it get in here? Well, very. Conditions were primitive. And perhaps nothing uh, illustrates how primitive things were in here uh, than the fact that they haven't invented the idea of putting the engine in a separate compartment. The engine is this big exposed thing in the middle of the room. This would of course get scalding hot and as men are being thrown around, uh, sometimes they would get a horrible scold. 
I imagine much of the time they probably weren't wearing much clothing in here because it might get up to 53 degrees Celsius in here and the sweat would be pouring off you. So you'd need lots of water. So they had water bottles everywhere, as well as all their personal kit, their rifles, their webbing and so forth. There'd be loads more ammunition, not just stowed like here. This is six pounder ammunition. This is machine gun ammunition here. But there'd be uh, more rounds on the floor and spent rounds, of course, coming out of here. Every time this fired, more fumes coming in and filling the place up. Every time anyone fired a machine gun or a pistol, more fumes again. And you might have to be here for a very long time, so you've got all the um, uh, smells associated with, with eight men that are in a hot box all day. Um, conditions were very grim indeed. And it is often said that the commonest cause of death in a World War tank was carbon monoxide poisoning. However, it's probably just one of those things that gets repeated a lot. Uh, it's likely that they would have noticed that a lot of people were dropping dead of some mysterious cause. And uh, the extractor fan probably wasn't beyond them at the time. They had invented the propeller. Um, but it's one of those things that gets said a lot, but it's probably spurious. But certainly men physically suffered in here. Uh, and I imagine from the heat, from the exhaustion, from the fumes, from the dehydration perhaps, uh, you might have got a fair few casualties that way. Um, now, if we uh, come over here, you can see the starting handle. So this is just a, a physical crank and you can see here how it engaged with the engine and so that's how you get things started. This massive thing here is the differential and you can see a, a differential brake which is controlled from the front by that big red lever. Um, one odd thing that does show on the outside of the tank is that they're not symmetrical. I said before that these were naval guns uh, and they were. Um, and it doesn't matter on a, a naval ship particularly uh, that all the gunners would be on one side and all the loaders on the other. But in a tank, when you've got things on either side, um, perhaps you would redesign the guns, but they didn't. Uh, so the gunner is on the same side, the loader is on the same side on both sides, which meant that in order to accommodate the space that those men needed, they're not actually completely symmetrical, and that shows on the outside of the tank. So, um, it was grim. It was deadly, it was extremely unpleasant to be in one of these early tanks, but they did at least work. Now, I'm like a kid in a sweet shop. I'm in the Vehicle Conservation Centre. Now, not every visitor to Bovington Tank Museum is lucky enough to get down on the floor and, and see all these vehicles close up. But if you are a visitor, you can actually see this from a viewing platform. Um, and it's, it's definitely worth it because this, this room is packed with all sorts of vehicles. Now, I was asked to make a video called My Five Favourite Tanks. But I asked, could, could they because I wanted to pick this vehicle. It's not really a tank. Um, is it an armoured fighting vehicle? Maybe it's not even that, but it's one of my favourites. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Universal Carrier. Um, now, one of the reasons I like this is they made loads of them, and these were used in action, so they proved themselves. We know that these were useful militarily because they made over a hundred thousand of these. They made more of these than Sherman tanks. Sherman tanks are positively rare compared with Universal Carriers. Um, so why were they so good? Well, part of the clue is in the, the name Universal. They could be used for so many things. They were uh, a, an armoured battle taxi, if you like, that uh, the British Army would have on call. So if you need a thing in another place, use a carrier. If you could get uh, ammunition, food, wounded, whatever you needed moving in a hurry from one place to another in action, this was the vehicle for you. It's a universal carrier. Sometimes they're just referred to as carriers because that's what they did. Um, so you wouldn't really fight from this, uh, not if you could help it, uh, but people did make all sorts of v um, battlefield modifications. And on this particular version, there are all sorts of extra things that have been mounted. There's a, a mount of some sort here that's got all sorts of holes that have been drilled in it. So I think over, over the years, several things have been put there and there's a, a mysterious mount here that even the curator of the museum could not identify. There was a thing that clearly went here. This has been modified many times. It's a universal carrier. So a typical British uh, infantry battalion in the late war would have a platoon of these. A platoon was typically 13 vehicles in uh, four sections of three plus a command vehicle. The command vehicle would have the long range uh, radio and uh, each section would uh, dismount perhaps a couple of Bren gun teams, a Piat team, a two-inch mortar team, a fair amount of firepower, but not many men. This is not an armoured personnel carrier. It's not an APC. You weren't, you weren't getting a section of men in, in the back here. You would perhaps have three men dismounting from this, just a small team. Um, you're not meant to charge the enemy in this going dagga 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 with your machine gun. Uh, it has no big howitzer mounted on it. Um, 
It's, as I say, a battle taxi. But the British used so many of these, and they sent a lot of them lend-lease to the Russians, and the Russians found them pretty useful on the Russian front and used them in profusion, even though they edited them out of most of the propaganda pictures, because they didn't want to admit to using all these Western, you know, decadent uh, lend-lease vehicles. They wanted to, you know, the, the, the internal population of the Soviet bloc to understand that it was, it was Soviet in engineering that won the war. Um, the universal carrier, ladies and gentlemen, and let's have a look at some of the bits. Right, so there's a battle on and you've got to get a thing over there. And the trouble is that over there is a cross country, but you've got a fully tracked battle taxi, your universal carrier. Great. Um, so if you're the gunner, what you're quite likely to do is not so much uh, position yourself like this at the gun, but maybe just grab there and grab there because these things are bucked forwards and backwards, uh, something terrible. And uh, if you wanted to keep your front teeth, you would perhaps want to prevent your head smashing against that. So there are grab handles here. The driver, of course, can uh, hold on to uh, the steering wheel and the people in the back can just grab whatever's, uh, whatever's handy and hang on for grim death. You could, of course, uh, try to shoot at the enemy whilst you're tr uh, charging along, but that probably wouldn't be very welcome um, because you're moderately likely to hurt yourself and very, very unlikely to hurt anything you're aiming at because the chances of hitting something on the move when you're bucking like this across country uh, would be just so low as to be ridiculous. And uh, I have seen a, a picture of one of these coming to a halt suddenly from speed and the back end comes up uh, uh, quite farcical uh, to a farcical height and then the whole thing comes crashing poof, down again. Um, so yes, it was, uh, it was hang on to your hats, but uh, you'll probably get there because the sides are at least reasonably bulletproof. It was bulletproof from the front. From the side, um, if, a, if an armor piercing round hit square on, uh, it could possibly come through the side. If you needed to get through an artillery barrage, which of course during a battle is quite common, uh, then you should, you should be fine. As long as you keep fairly low, uh, the shrapnel won't come through these sides. It's an armoured battle taxi. This one is a Mark II. Uh, there are many things that mark it out as a Mark II. One being this step, which is a remarkably thick piece of metal that really have to be quite so thick, that's like armour plate thickness. Uh, but this is a, a, a mounting step to make it slightly easier to get in. Anyway, the reason I'm down here is to tell you something very unusual about the steering mechanism of these. Now, here we have a, a double bogey, and it's um, very unusual in that this entire assembly could move out and in to the hull sides. So as it came out, it would bend the track outwards in the middle so the whole vehicle would then move to the right. Um, so with this mechanism, the vehicle steered much like a car and it had a, an ordinary steering wheel. And I'm told that people who are used to driving cars found it quite easy to get used to driving these, even at speed over country, because it had more of a car-like feel. And like all proper vehicles, it had the steering wheel on the right-hand side. So here I am in the back, and this is the passenger compartment, if you like. Um, there wouldn't be many passengers, well, at least there wouldn't be many passengers going into battle, though I have seen photographs of these absolutely festooned with people grabbing a lift. Um, passenger comfort was not clearly utmost in the, uh, their design requirements. Uh, this here is where the butt of a short magazine Lee Enfield rifle would go. You can see that would uh, hold the front of it, so you've got two rifles there. Another rifle there, there's other mounting points for them, for a stowing kit. You could just about get what you needed for yourself, and there are just things here and there to hang on to. Uh, you'd probably, if you were going through a, a, a barrage, you'd have your helmet down and your head down, and you would just be waiting to get to your position, bucking this way forwards and backwards. Uh, now, um, this has been converted for quite a few uses over the years. I can see uh, a surviving antenna position here. The radio would normally go in this corner, but it's, it's missing. Uh, for some post-war experimental use, they've put this uh, tank here. Um, there were tanks a bit like that, but much bigger in the back for the WASP version. The WASP was the flamethrower version of this. Um, which uh, was very vulnerable in towns because, of course, anyone could lean out of an upstairs window and just drop a grenade into an open-top vehicle. So it wasn't used in built-up areas, but uh, it was pretty nasty out in the open. And uh, I've heard tales that uh, the Germans uh, were not uh, very kind with captured crew members of wasps because uh, it was considered an ungentlemanly weapon. Um, and so if you wanted to get out of this thing, there was no, there was no particularly um, uh, elegant way of doing it. Uh, you just had to sort of jump over the side and get down and run to position. Then this would quite often retreat. Rather than hang around where the enemy might see it and shoot at it, uh, the driver who would normally stay with the vehicle would find somewhere uh, behind the lines to stick it behind a tree, behind a fold of land, out of the way. And when 
uh, and each section had its own radio, which you could communicate with the, uh, the drivers. Uh, you could say, right, we need help now. Uh, they could pop smoke, perhaps, using either the forward uh, mortar that would have been dismounted, or quite often mounted here, uh, although it's missing on this particular version, there was a two-inch mortar. So this vehicle could also fire smoke forwards to, to cover a, a rescue. These could swoop in, the guys could just pile in any old howl, and then you're off again. So you can't dismount vast hordes of troops to defeat the enemy, but you can throw out a quick skirmish line and then retreat that skirmish line very quickly in the universal carrier. And if I have one favourite, it's this one. This is the Churchill 7. Now, you may think that this was named after Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, and some people say, well, it was really in secret. It was, it was a way of flattering him. But uh, officially, at least, it was named after an ancestor of his, who was also unsurprisingly called Churchill, who was the commander at the Battle of Blenheim, for which he was awarded the Blenheim Palace, which is you know, quite a big award for fighting a battle, but he did do awfully well. Anyway, this is the Churchill 7. Um, and it's a heavy tank. You see, it's got a bridging weight here of 40 tons. Um, and people go on and on. Don't they know about how flipping great the Tiger was? And it was so well armoured and nothing could pe penetrate its armour because it was so thickly armoured. Four inches, four inches armour in the front of a Tiger. Here, you can see, six inches thicker. In fact, in places, it's up as much as nine where you've got the, the big bulges in front of the... Uh, the front of the turret there, either side of the gun. So this was extremely well armoured, at least this version of it was. This is the Mark VII. Earlier versions were a bit thinner, but um, they were brought up to the, the, the standard of the, the Mark VII by having extra bits welded onto them. Um, and uh, it's quite narrow. One of the reasons that you can get so much thick armour on the tank is it's, it's only... It's only that wide, the, the bit you have to armour, uh, which is uh, one and a half metres if you're French, or 59 inches uh, if you're blessed with the imperial system. Now, uh, it's got uh, periscopes here that swivel about, which can look over the, the horns. These are sometimes referred to as the horns of the tank, the bits that stick out the front. And one good thing about these is that I can do this without hitting the end of the barrel, which means that you could turn the turret, even if you're in the middle of a forest or something, you could turn the turret to aim the gun without hitting a tree. Uh, which is uh, something that uh, lots of other tanks had problems with. This tank had absolutely peerless cross-country capability, uh, a capability which amazed even the people who operated it. It's got these big, uh, very grippy tracks, loads and loads and loads of very small wheels down the side. We'll take a look at them later. And one thing that it was particularly amazingly good at was climbing hills. And I've read several accounts of people saying that they were looking at one of these going up a hill and up a hill at crazier and crazier angles. And somehow it didn't fall off the hill. It got to the top of the hill where the Germans thought, you can never get a tank there. No one will ever get a tank up that hill. And so the British were able to win the action because they were able to get a gun into a position that the Germans thought, nah, no, no one's ever going to get a gun there. So, Fabulous cross-country capability, which is uh, extremely important. Um, I read a wonderful tale, that's in uh, John, John Foley's Mailed Fist, uh, where he has to get into the Reichswald forest and there's a big queue forming for the bridge they've just built across an anti-tank ditch. So what does he do? He thinks, well, I know, I'll drive into the anti-tank ditch and out of the anti-tank ditch. And so he does. He just drives straight into it and straight out the other side because, again, the Germans have dug this ditch. No one's going to tank, get a tank across that. Well, in a Churchill, you could. So that's, that's a good reason to, to, to like this tank. I've been told that it's the most survivable tank of World War II, um, partly because it was so very well armoured, uh, but also because it had lots of uh, escape hatches, including escape hatches in the side. We'll take a look at those later. Uh, the gun... Yeah, it's mediocre. This standard gun is a 75 millimeter, very similar. It is the, based on the, the American multi-purpose gun. It could fire high explosives and armor piercing. The high explosive shells were very good, very effective, and that was sort of fine because this is an infantry tank. It's specifically uh, designed to support infantry. And some people will say, oh no, you can't like the Churchill because they were slow. And yes, they were quite slow. Uh, this might uh, manage 15 miles per hour, but actually that was desirable. They were the, the people who said, we want a tank that can, that can be like this, wanted the tank to be slow because it's an infantry support vehicle. If you're in a fast tank and there are loads of troops about the place uh, and they're, they're suddenly in comes the fire and, and things are looking a bit hairy, it's very tempting, if you're in a fast tank, to just stick your foot on the accelerator and get out of there, which is great for you, but it's not very good, is it, for the infantry you're supposed to be supporting. So if you have a slow tank, the infantry knows that you're going to stick with them because you can't suddenly rush off 
So there was actually a virtue in being slow. Um, now, people say that, you know, I have a British bias. And they're right, I do have a British bias. So, yes, I like a British tank. And this saw a lot of action. And any tank that sees a lot of action tends to make its uh, way to the top of people's favorite lists. Prototype tanks that never got off the drawing board. You know, yeah, it's an interesting idea, but never got off the drawing board. And stuff that was never tested in action against the enemy you know, is, is less likely to be, to be loved by a tank enthusiast. This saw loads of action. The very first Churchill saw action in the Dieppe raid, which, yes, it went wrong, but the Allies learned a lot. Uh, for instance, that you can't get up uh, a shingle beach in a tracked vehicle. Not even a Churchill was able to manage that. Uh, this particular one is the crocodile flamethrower version. Normally, there would be a Beezer machine gun here in the front of the hull, but uh, instead, we've got the uh, business end of the flamethrower. This was one of the most feared and effective weapons of World War II. It had a very unusual amount of capacity. In other words, you could shoot an awful lot of flame out of the front of it and quite a long way to a range of something like 80 yards, which is a long way for a flamethrower. So it would greatly outrange uh, any infantry flamethrower. And because of the Bowser, which we'll have a look at in a moment uh, at the back, this could shoot something like 80 one-second bursts, which again is enormously more than anything that uh, a man could carry on his back. And, and this was... Um, pretty much guaranteed to defeat uh, something like a, a pillbox or a bunker that the, the Germans would be defending an area in. You bring one of these up and it's so thickly armored that there's almost nothing that can hurt it. And then you threaten with this thing. You didn't even actually have to burn anyone. What they would do sometimes is what was called a wet squirt. So they wouldn't actually have the, the, the fuel that they're squirting out the front. Essentially, it's a giant water pistol. Uh, they wouldn't have it burning. They would just squirt a load of the fuel all over the, the building and through windows and, and firing slits and so forth. Uh, and the people inside would be aware, oh, I seem to have fuel on me and there's fuel everywhere. I don't particularly want to be burned alive. And you, you then could just wait for them to run away, and which almost invariably, uh, because they weren't idiots, they did. Um, and when you, so the thickness of this armor at the front, this solid chunk. So the driver would be sitting here. This is his window when, uh, uh, when he wanted to be able to see what he was doing well. And you could just see he's just got this solid door of metal. This was a very thickly armored tank. And because it's so narrow, uh, where the crew compartment is, um, you could afford to make it very, very thickly armored because it, you know, the smaller the box, the, the lighter the box is when you make it thickly armored. Um, uh, let's take a look around the side. Now here, we have something that made this tank perhaps the most survivable tank of the war, the side escape hatch. Uh, it's a, a thick piece of steel. You see this one is round, and that tells you that this is a Churchill 7. The earlier marks had square doors, but the one problem with those is that if a big shell went off next to the tank, sometimes the, the, the pressure would cause a square door to, to buckle very, very slightly, but that could make it very difficult to open. Um, you could get in and out of the, uh, of the tank, protected by the, this bulletproof hatch, and uh, this also made it very adaptable. So this vehicle was used as the basis for a lot of um, engineering tanks, a lot of Hobart's funnies converted into things that were specialist for laying bridges and uh, filling up gaps in trenches and, uh, and flamethrower tanks. Um, so the side escape hatch, very important. Very few tanks had them. It made it adaptable and it made it safe. Wheels! It had loads of them. Well, 44. And uh, they, they don't have rubber tires on. They're just steel, quite simple things. And they're not powered. These are just rollers. And you can see they're on very, very heavy springs. And one of the advantages of this design with lots and lots of very small wheels is if you do go over a mine and get a wheel blown off, it doesn't matter. This tank could carry on, even if it had three of its wheels on the same side of the tank blown off, it could still keep going. Nah. So yes, this is my favorite tank, the Churchill. Um, and I think perhaps the main reason is familiarity. I, I made little kits of Churchills when I was a boy, and I can remember gluing all the little wheels on and, and so forth. And when you make a kit of a tank, uh, you develop uh, not just a knowledge of it, but a certain love for it. You've put the effort into making the model, and you've, you've seen all the bits from all the angles, and, and it's, it's British, and I'm not going to apologize for that. The British invented the tank. It's very low, it's squat, it's heavy, and I've always had a certain sympathy for that. 
Uh, I've always, uh, when, I, when I've been picturing, picturing myself as, as a, a knight or something in, in the olden days, I've always imagined myself in the really heavy armor, standing in the middle and battling my way through the French, you know, in, in a slow, uh, methodical way, blasting away with the, all oh, right, I didn't have a gun. But the point is that this got up close with the enemy and was tested in battle many, many times and proved its worth. There were many actions that the British won in World War II because they had Churchills. Oh, wow. Well, those are my top five armoured fighting vehicles here at the Tank Museum in Bovington. And if you want to know more about tanks, well, you could subscribe to the Tank Museum's very own YouTube channel, or you could like its Facebook page, or you might want to go to my channel. Uh, my channel is called Lindy Beige, and I'll be making more videos about other tanks that are here. And uh, there's general discussion of warfare and that. Bye.